As we are doing the name of the gods of ancient Egypt, we're going to start with the, uh, just going to zoom that out a little bit. We're going to start with the creation. So the first god of creation in pretty much all the myths is known, the great water, known as the first god. So we're going to just, uh, I'm going to show you the hieroglyph for the, the Nun. So Nun is basically, or Nu, is a pot. His name is Nun, so I'll just see if I could do it side. So the first one was Nun, so I'll just go like this. That's the first name of the god of this Egypt, of the creation myth. Let's see if we can get that a little closer. This is the name of Nun. He is the first. He is the ocean, the great water, the chaos that, that came out of nothing, just there's nobody yet, there's no gods, there's no demons, there's nothing, it's just chaos. And Nun was written as three pots of water, or three oil jars, which are known as Nu. And by putting three of them, you're basically saying that there are many aspects of, of Nu. So that's the three first, and then the water waves. All right. Sometimes you may have him as there's other ways of writing him, but this is just one of the ways. Right, that, that defines the water. And this is the god Nun. This is the uh, the chaotic water of time. And usually you'd have a hieroglyph that goes with it. It would be a god. So the god with the beard, with the head, and then you'd have the uh, back, and then it come down. This would be like pretty much the uh, the nemesis, the back of the head like that. And then the neck that come down, and then you'd have basically the neck, and then eventually you'd have, well, let's just do the bottom part of the leg here, which I'm pretty good at. And then down like this with the foot, and then back up again. And this is a determinative for the god. This doesn't, it's not pronounced, but to tell you that this is not just something about water or pot, but this is actually nun. This is the creation of all. So this, everything's inside nun or new, whichever way you want to go with it. The next god to be formed, so this is the first god, right? This is the first. The second god to be formed after, and we'll divide them. Now, he was sort of there in chaos, and that's why he's known as the god of chaos. Nothing really created him. He kind of just is the consciousness of chaos. And parallel to Nu, who was first created, there was a second god that kind of mer made itself happen. Uh, it was always there, really. Nobody really says he created. He was always there. Not like a tumor he self-created. He came from somewhere. But what we have is the great serpent god. We have Apep. Losing a little ink here. Sorry, we're using the traditional ink, so I'm not... Ooh, this one's a terrible. Apep. Apep is the great serpent. He was formed from the chaos of Nun. He just kind of swims around it. He is chaos personified. Not just blank water, but he became Apep. And Apep is Eapep. So the way it's written is with a pillar that is on its side. Like that. Right? This is the word Ea. It's a, it's a biliteral. And then you have the two stools for P. Right? Then you have, and then we decorate them with little lines like that. No big deal. And then you have the actual determinative, like the god himself. And since we're going in this direction, we'll just draw him coming down. So the way it is, is uh, I like drawing snakes uh, from ancient Egypt. They're really nice. It just goes up, curls back down, goes up again, curls back down, goes up again, curls back down. As many times as you like, really. But I like to finish it off at four. And then the head. And there's the great serpent, Apep. He came out, he kind of was formed from the waters of chaos. So known as chaos and Apep is the personification of chaos. Now, when the great mound was uh, created, the Ben-Ben mound, right? The, the mound of, uh, which pretty much all of earth is created. So if you had, let's say the, the chaotic waters of Nun, right? Then the great mound, which is a pyramid shape, really. We, we can make it even a step pyramid since it was the first. The great mound was created from all this, right? These were always there, and then suddenly the mound was created. And the snake, of course, swims around. 
is, uh, is around, Nun is over here, and this is the Great Mound. And from the Great Mound, which is known as the Ben Ben, the Ben Ben, right? The Great Mound came the first god. And the first god, if you follow the, the Heliopolitan, uh, which is the, uh, the, sun, the sun worship culture, cult, uh, or, the, uh, or the, the worship of, from Iunu, you would have a tomb. Now, a tomb is pretty much self-created. He created himself. And he is the first true god in a sense that we know them as a kind of a body of a person, embodies consciousness and awareness, and is aware. And, and a tomb is written very simply. So let me just do uh, a tomb, let's say, on the mountain. He self-created himself. So we'll just do a simple, quick hieroglyph like this, right? We'll do the a tomb sitting down. That's the uh, kind of like sitting down like that uh, with the hair and the beard. And we'll have his arms raised up like this, right? So he is the self-created. He created himself for the first time. And his name is a tomb. And his name is actually pronounced Tim, not a tomb. Him, right? Even though we say a tomb. So I'll just put it here anyways. A tomb is actually Tim. His determinative is just a bread loaf and a sort of a fence like here. Fence like sled with a line that comes like that. That is the, this is the word, and then of course you'd have the determinative for God, which we'll do pretty quickly like this, right? With the back, and then the beard, right? Like this, and then the beard, and then the leg that's sitting down. This is the sitting position. So this is the word for Atum. So you have the self, the chaos of waters of Nun, from Nun came uh, personification of the chaos is Apep, the great serpent. And then from there, the mound arose, right? Let's just do the numbers so we don't get lost. And then we have the mound. And then from the mound, we have a, a tomb. So one, two, three, four. And then he rose, he became, he, he basically self-created. He willed himself into existence. Now, there are many versions of who other gods appear. There was Ra because Apep swallowed a tomb to get, to get the consciousness back. But then he, he escaped as Ra, as the Kepri, as the scarab beetle. So that is also a self-created being in itself. It created itself when he swallowed it. But we're not going to go that far. We're going to go now to the next creation. So after Atum, Atum is by himself. He's in the darkness. He's there on the mountain. And he wants to create more of himself. Well, what else can he create? Well, now we are entering the Aeneid now. Well, there is something called the Pesajet. These are the great Aeneid, the great nine. So the great nine or the nine gods, the great nine, they are known as the, uh, the Aeneid in English. Whoops, Aeneid. And they are known in Egyptian as, whoops, let's just do this, Pesajet. They are the Pesajet, right? The great nine. And they are in the Hall of Judgment of Osiris when you are basically uh, uh, judged by Osiris. And the I'll just write this out quickly. The Pesajet, or the great nine, right? We'll try to get it all in a vertical like that. Like that. So, um, well, let's zoom it out a little. Like that. And we'll go over here like this. Okay, so now you have the great nine. I'll just do a quick uh, Pesajet. So the Pesajet is this symbol here. It's a circle with a line in the middle. And then you have the T, right? This is the Pesed. This is the Pesajet. So this is a full word that says Pesajet. And then you have, um, you have basically the symbol for the gods, which is a flagpole, which was set at the temples. And there's three of them to do no plurality. That means there's more than one. So Pesajet, this is the symbol for the nine gods or the great Aeneid, the Pesajet. Now, who are the nine gods? Well, from a tomb sprung, he needed to create the actual essence of our world. So from him, he created not the land yet, no, two beings he created from himself. Who are the two beings? Does anybody know the two beings that came from a tomb? So we have chaos and then the serpent, which is a personification of chaos. And then the mound arose, the great mountain, and then a tomb self-created. No, I'm not from Egypt. Uh, do, do we know who the two, who did a tomb create? 
And he basically spat them out. No, Mut and Geb, no. Mut is a different god. She, Mut is the, uh, the consort of Amun. Geb is another god. Yes, that's right. Same wise, Coil, it's Shu and Tefnut. So the, the, in the pyramid texts of Unis, the, the oldest written texts in ancient Egypt uh, that we have, the hieroglyphs, which are in the pyramid at Saqqara um, of King Unis, it actually says that Atum, and I'm sorry to say this for everybody if it's a little inappropriate, he masturbated, and when he climaxed, right? So if we do the climaxing, right? When he climaxed, he spat. So at the same time as he climaxed sexually, he spat at the same time. And by spitting, thus came forth the two gods. So masturbation, and once he climaxed, then he basically spat both Shu and Tefnut. That's the myth. That's what's actually written down. I'm not making this up. It's written on the pyramid text of Unis. That's the oldest text in the, uh, of ancient Egypt. Uh, so he spat out these two after he masturbated and climaxed. Shu is the personification of air and many other things, but mostly air. Tefnut is moisture. So how do you write Shu? Well, here's the name of Shu. So now we have two, three, four. We have the Shu came first, Tefnut came second. They didn't come out at the same time. They actually came out one after the other. So Shu is air. How do we write Shu? Well, Shu is written quite simply, really. Shu is written as the sedge plant of Egypt, like that. And then you have the chick, which is the uh, the U sound, the unilateral alphabet U. Right, it's just a little chick, like a, a bird. All right, I'm just doing it quickly. Sorry, I wrote it the other way. It's fine. So this is Shu, and of course Shu is male, and Tefnut is female. Right, so we'll do the male god, so we know. So, Shu, that's how do you write it. This is the word sh, Shu, and that's U, so it's Shu, it just complements it. Okay, moving on. Now, Tefnut is pretty straightforward. Tefnut is moisture, and it's written this way. It's written as, I'm going to write it uh, the same way as Shu, just to keep it simple. It's going to be Tef. So a T, it's, it's going to be pronounced phonetically like that. Tef. Now, depending on the version you want, but the way that it's well known for it being written is Tef, and then it has a Nu, the pot, and then Nut. So Tef, Nut. That's how it's written. So T, F, and then the Nu, which we have in Nun up here. Just one of them, nu, nu, and then t. So two t's, so tefnut. So, of course, any word that ends with t is feminine. So tefnut was feminine. And that's tefnut. And then we add the god, the goddess. So now we don't do a male hieroglyph. We do a female hieroglyph for the goddess. And usually it's just uh, a female. And then you have a little breasted area and then an arm like that. Sorry, uh, let me see if I can do that better. But basically it's just a woman and she has her long hair in the back. And you can see the uh, cleavage and then just sitting down. So that's just the only difference. Uh, maybe I can draw them here. Let me show you the men and female version of, of hieroglyphs so you, don't get, so you don't get confused. So the male, you draw the head. It's quite simple, really. And then you go to the back of the hair and you come down like that. And then you draw over like this. Okay, the male god, of course, is and with, uh, with the beard. Uh, I try to keep it simple like a simple hieroglyph, and then the leg, and that's it. That's the male. Uh, usually you have more on the back of the hair like that. So it looks like, you know, they have their wig on. The female version is just simply the same. It comes down in the back of the head like this, comes over like that, right, the wig. No beard, just comes down like that. And then, sorry, the ink is making it difficult. Right, like this, and then you draw the leg. Now the only difference is, you bring the leg over, but as it comes up, there's a breast, and that's it. 
like that, and you just kind of add to it. And that's really it. This is just one way of drawing, and I can draw it better, but I'm using this reed pen. So you see that's the only difference between the god and goddess, god and goddess. That's it. All right, moving on. So now Tefnut, right? If you guys are joining in, this is what we're talking about, the creation. We had Nun the Chaos. We had Apep, that is a personification of Chaos, the great serpent, the great evil that is conquered every day at night. Uh, for Ra to rise in the morning. Then you had the wa the mountain, the Ben Ben, which is right over here, rising from the water of chaos. And Atum, who self-created himself, the god who created himself out of consciousness. Atum right there. And then Atum masturbated, climaxed, and then spat out Shu and Tefnut. And this is more air and moisture. And from them, two more gods came forth. Do you know? Now remember, we're, we're dealing with the nine of the great gods of the Aeneid. So now you have one, two, three. We have three so far. Now we're going to need another six more. Who are the other uh, six? Who's the next after this? Yes, that's right, uh, Nesreen. So Geb and Nut. So Geb is the male and Nut is the female. So now we have Geb. And then we have, remember, feminine is T, and we have Nut. Geb is the earth, the land itself, right? He is the earth. And Nut is the sky. Geb is written as a duck, so we'll do it the other way now, because the word, because he is the great cackler. He's known as the great cackler. Right, the duck, which is, which is also is a sa, but in this case it's a it's a geb, and then the foot, the, or the leg, and this is the word b, so it's geb, and then of course the determinative for the god, which we used I showed you earlier, so that's it. Now you have geb, geb. That's this is the word for geb. This is the, the, the lord of the earth of the land. He is basically what you're standing on right now is geb. Then you have Nut, which is the sky itself. She also carries the word Nu. Remember Tefnut and Nu? You're using that same symbol. So if you're going in that direction, you're going to write the Nu. And then the T. Nut. That's it. It's just that. Nut. But the determinative for Nut requires not just the goddess itself, which we did over here. You have to put, and this is the Egyptians made sure that, you always have the hieroglyph for the sky. So it's almost like a canopy over you. So this is the symbol for the sky. It's like a canopy over something. So Nut. And then you can add the goddess as well. All right? Yeah, so that's it. Nut. All right, guys, we're down to four more gods. And then we're done with this video. So we'll just go over here. We'll cross over here. So now from Nut came four gods. Now we're at one, two, three, four, five. We need four more of the great uh, gods. Who are the other four gods? Right? No, sorry, six, seven, eight. Now we have uh, sorry, sorry. So it's actually five, six, seven. I'm just counting in, in, the, in terms of creation. So we'll have uh, the four gods here. Two, three. Now who are the other four gods? The last of the four, which basically both Shu and Nut created. I mean, Geb and Nut created the, the four of them, and that's the last four. Does anybody know? Does anybody know the four? One, two, three, four. The last four gods of the great Aeneid. Uh, yes, Osiris, Isis, Set. Everyone always forgets. That's right, Aaron, but there's one more. Everyone always forgets the last one. Uh, Nephthys. Yes, that's right, Nisreen, Kamal. There it is. So you have Isis, Osiris, Set, and Nephthys. Now, uh, Anubis and Maat are not uh, part of the Aeneid. They are much older gods in a different form. Okay, so the first, of course, is the famous Osiris. Then his sister came. Isis, and then Nephthys, I think I'm losing my, no, we're okay. Neph, 
this, and then we have Seth, or Seth, whichever way you want to write his name. I'm just going to sharpen this. So these are the four gods that you have, and I'll show you this, guys, and then we'll be done. All right. Okay, no, Isis is just a goddess. It's not a god. We're not thinking Judeo-Christian or Muslimic here. This is completely different. This is multicultural. This is multiple gods, thousands of gods, like the Hindus. Think of Hindus and you'll understand ancient Egypt. Don't think like Christian, Muslim, or Jew. It doesn't work. Buddhist or Taoism. It doesn't, it's not the same thing. Completely separate. All right. So Osiris is written in many ways. He has, four, he has two versions, but we're just going to write this one version. Uh, we're basically, Osiris is Usir in Egyptian. So his name is Usir. That's really how you write his name, how you say his name, Usir. We say Osiris. So Usir is written really simply as an I, which is Ir. Now, actually, that could be the other way around, but sometimes it's like that. The I, and from the I, you have a throne. Now, sometimes they're reversed. All right? Sometimes they're reversed. But most of the time it's written this way, but other times it's reversed. But there's another version which I'm not going to show today because it's not very common. All right. Isis is really pronounced, it can be pronounced many ways, east, ast, or just st. But generally it's well known as being, I'm just going to do the transliteration, ast. So her name is written, with the hieroglyph of the throne, which is this, uh, this which can be uh, us or st, it can be both. And her name is written really as, like that, the same thing with the throne, right? We're doing the, uh... now if I drew this for you so you could see what it looks like, it's pretty much like that. That's how really it is. But I'm just doing the, uh, the, the cursive style. And then you would have the T for the ast, that's it. It would be st, and this would be the complement, the T. And, and then they would add the egg for the feminine as a creator. She's basically a female creator. She gives birth, much like Geb, but she gives birth as a female, but being basically not a mammal in a sense, but an egg, creating the egg or coming out of the egg. So this is Isis's name. Nephthys is really pretty much like... Uh, is really written like this, actually. It's just a, a little bit of a neftis, it's neftis. So it would be written much like this. So you would have the neb. Now we say nef, but it's actually neptis, right? It's neb, and then you'd have the, the hut, but we're not gonna show you that right now. Anyways. And this is, and it would be a little bit of a facade of a palace. And this is Nephthys' name. You, this would be on top of her head. So let's say if you had the goddess Isis over here, this would be on her head. You know, let's say this is her hair. Right? Come like this with the ear and then over like that. And then she would come down like this. If you see what I mean, right? You see, this would be on her head like that. And the same would be on the head of Nephthys over here. The last one is Set. His name is Seth, but it's actually Set without the E or if you don't want. And this god is written as an actual creature. Now, we don't know what this animal is. It could be just a fake hybrid animal. Uh, but Set is really written as um, an animal. We, we think it could be a hybrid of a jackal with a dog. It's very difficult to assess. It's really just a nose that comes down like that, two ears. Right, and then basically, it's he's that's the head of the the god, and then the body would come down like we showed you before with the with the uh, the the the, um, the wig, right? And he's basically sitting down the same way as any god, like that. And that's basically set. He would be written out this way. Sometimes they put the T in there, but not always. He'd be 
pretty much it. And Seti, Seti, which is the uh, Seti the first and second, but Seti the first, which is the father of Ramses the second, he had his name as Seti. So he had Set in his name. So there it is, guys. So we're pretty much done here. Let's go back to uh, telling you what we were doing today. So today we discussed the creation myth. Uh, we showed you all the gods of, of the actual creation. So if you think of like the Romans and the Greeks and they had their creation gods and Zeus and Kronos and Gaia and all these type of gods, the Egyptians had a concept of creation from chaos. So chaos had the goddess uh, Nun. And from Nun, the, the chaos, the water of chaos and turmoil and nothing was really balanced a uh, the great snake was created, Apep, and he basically swam in the waters of chaos. Apep is the great serpent that Ra has to defeat every, every day. From Apep broke a consciousness, a self-created consciousness, and that was Atum. Well, before Atum, between these two, the third thing, while the water was chaotic, a mountain came out of it. This is known as the Benben, the Benben mountain. The mountain rose out of the water, so you had the first land. And from on the land, you had Atum. He was self-created from the consciousness of chaos. He was basically the organized thoughts of chaos. He finally came together and became an organized idea. Atum, self-created, desired, I guess, to have um, children or offspring. And so he masturbated. And as he climaxed, he spat at the same time. So he, this is, this is written on the walls of the pyramid text from ancient Egypt. This is an account. I'm not making this up. It's written on there. So he masturbated, climaxed, and then spat. And when he spat, he created his two children, Shu and Tefnut, the male and female. Shu is air, and, mo and Tefnut is moisture, and this is their name. And then from there, Shu and Tefnut created their two children, which is Geb and Nut, which is the earth and the sky. Geb and Nut. And from Geb and Nut, they created four children, which we all know of. They created Osiris, Isis, Nephthys, and Set. Eventually, Isis married his brother. I mean, Isis and Osiris married. They were brother and sister. They married. That's why a lot of royalty and pharaohs, brothers and sisters, marry all the time um, because of this myth. And then Nephthys and Set we're basically together. But there was a bit of a turmoil over here because she always helped them out and he was always jealous of Osiris. He eventually killed his brother. The last thing that really isn't part of the... Now, Atum, Shu, Tefnut, Geb, Nut, Osiris, Isis, Nephthys, and Seth are considered the nine. The Pesajet. They are the nine, the great nine that are judge anyone in the hall. And they are known, and this is their symbol for where they dwell, the Pesajet. And that's it. And that's pretty much it, guys. The only last thing I'd say is um, out of the two, this is he's not part of the two, but from Osiris and Isis, a child was born. Does anybody know who this child is? He's not part of the nine, but he's pretty much the last of, you could say, the pantheon, really. Does anybody know which child is of who gave birth by Isis, uh, Isis and Osiris? Yes, Jen, Ren, Jen. Good job. Yep, Horus. Horus is the last, but he is not part of the nine officially. Sometimes in some cult, in some periods of history, he is considered um, part of the history. But I'm gonna sh I'm gonna do Horus. Sorry if you hear that banging. It's my cat who's going in the cupboards. Thanks, kitty cat. All right. So Horus. So let's zoom in. I'm gonna show you a nice hieroglyphic drawing of Horus. This is Horus. It's really just a falcon. Horus is never defined more than with anything worse, but he is basically just a falcon. And I'll just do it in a nice cursive style. Oh, that's not good. I don't like that one at all. But mm, okay, let's do a second one. There we go. And there'll be three little lines for his tail. And then would come up like that. And then you'd have his legs. And then they decorated sometimes like that. I could draw his face a little better. You know, I can do the curve of the, the falcon. 
a little of the eye. Uh, it's okay. Not really. I don't like it, but it's okay. Anyways, so that's Horus, and his name can be pronounced as two ways. We don't say Horus, that's Greek or Roman. We say Hur, right? Or we say Huru, and that's it. All right, guys, so that's pretty much it. This is the creation myth that I wanted to share with everybody. Um, and that's pretty much it. Sorry if I'm not reading your comments. I'm trying to teach you something, so I can't really take the time to read everything. But now I can do it. I'm going to give you five-minute Q&A. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. I'm here to educate, guys. I'm, not here to, I'm here to entertain you, but I'm also here to educate you. So in case you're interested in the mythology or the history or the culture or the writing... Thank you very much, Visionary. Any questions before we complete this session? Any questions? Are these hieroglyphs considered hieratic? Uh, no. These are hi cursive hieroglyphs. So I'll give you an example of... Oh, see, like this has got to... I got to mix this up. Got a little pasty. That's why I wasn't getting any ink out of it. So here's an example of hieroglyphs. Give me a second, guys. Uh, there's no degree, Joyce Bassam. I'm learning on my own. I bought the books and I studied for six years. I don't need somebody to teach me. I can just teach myself because all the knowledge is out there. All right. So you can do the same too. If you need any books, guys, or materials, just send me anything and uh, send me a DM and I'll send you anything I can. Will this video be available for viewing later? No, unfortunately, I'm not going to do that. Um, I may. Let me see. I might put it on YouTube. Just go to my YouTube page. Why not? A lot of people want to do that. Uh, but I'll edit it for sure. Okay, so the difference between hieroglyphs to cursive hieroglyphs to hieratic, I mean to hieratic. So if you drew, for example, let's do the, um, the, uh, the owl. I like the owl. Everyone loves owls, right? Everyone loves Harry Potter. So here we go. If we drew an owl, the first stage of the owl would come down like this, right? Right? You'd have the curve like this. You'd have the ears of the owl. You'd have uh, the, the arm like that. And then you'd come down like this. You come over like that. And then you have a second leg. From here, you'd have the lower feather of the owl. And then you'd have the legs like that. Right? And there's your owl. And you can decorate the eyes any way you like. And there is the eyes. So that's the first stage. This is hieroglyphic. But then you have cursive hieroglyph, which is faster. So you'd have the same principle, the ears, and then you'd come down like this, and then you'd go... I'm losing ink, sorry. You go over like that, and then you come down like this. Maybe a little more down like that. And then you do the eyes. And that's cursive hieroglyphs. Not hieratic, cursive hieroglyphs. Now, hieratic has many versions of this. Now, hieratic grew with hieroglyphics. So... This is the first version, this is the second version, and the third version of the, the hieratic is really, and this is the most common, is like almost like a number three. That's the letter M. This is your hieratic version of a faster writing. There's other versions of this too, but this is the most common version of the owl. And finally, you have the demotic. Demotic is the same thing. For some reason, demotic kept it the same, but it would have it like very, you know, very fast like that or very crookedly like that. So that's demotic, but this is hieratic. So that's how it is. And then you have Greek, of course, when you entered the, uh, not the Greek, but the uh, Coptic. Eventually, when you had the Coptic, they just did an M, really. So they, they kind of reversed it. They took this M and flipped it over, and now you have it this way. So you have your first, second, third, and then you have your fourth. And that's it. These are hieroglyphics, cursive hieroglyphics, hieratic, and then demotic. Oh, sorry, so that should be the fourth one. And that should be the fifth one. There you go. Okay, so these are the stages of the, the word M. All right, any questions? 
Any more questions? Where'd you get your degree? Do you like video? What about claims that the pyramids are actually thousands of years old? Or no, we're not going to get into that Cipri's. Uh, that's just another topic. Uh, you can read materials on that. Ch any child? No. Neftis and Seth As Asra had no children. Respect. No problem. Hello. How are you? I'm good. Thank you, Pegasus. Are you going to have this saved? Yes. I'm going to put it on YouTube. Something wrong. Uh, any teaching of any teaching on the light? Nine gods? Well, I already just did the teaching on the nine gods. Wonderful. Thanks. No problem. What do you think about the Kurdistan? Okay. No, that's unrelated. No, sir. You told us good way. I think everybody understood. Great. Any questions? What would be great? Thanks. What about you? Raw? Well, raw is a whole different topic. Um, let's see. If you want raw... Ra is written in two forms. He's written either in just a, as a circle, right? That's Ra. We say Re. Even the Coptics say Re. They don't say Ra. They say Re. We say Ra as Westerners. And then you can have his name written out phonetically. R-E. That's all you need to worry about is the R and the Ayin. Well, if you know your alphabet, there's your R and there's your arm. Right? There's the ray. So you have the R. If you have the R and you have the, the ayin. So ray and then you finish it off. Now you could do two things. You can add the circle in here to denote that this is raw because it could mean anything, right? Or you can just, like we did before, we just put a determinative of a god. Right? Determinative of a god. And then you'd have ray. And there's raw. What about Ra? He said, fights chaos every day, but he didn't write his name. Who? Ra? Oh, yeah, that's right. Here's the name Ra. Uh, that's really cool to see the difference. Of course, you're welcome, Jenran. Where does Thoth, Jehuti, come in the nine? So Jehuti is also considered a self-created. He had his own, much, much, much of the children of Ra. He is basically the consciousness of Ra, and he basically came out of there. Uh, he is not ch a child of anyone in particular. Um, he also sort of a self-created, but not really self-created, but he was created from Ra. That's the myth. So Jehuti came from Ra, and that's how, like, Sekhmet comes from Ra. But don't forget, the religions change. The mythology shifts and changes through the centuries, right? Osiris wasn't prominent until the 12th century, uh, 6th century. I mean, 6th dynasty, excuse me, 6th to 7th to 8th dynasty. Before that, he wasn't very well known, Osiris. You know, before that, you had Anubis, you had Sokar, you had Hathor, uh, you had Atum. Like, these gods weren't prominent until much later. Okay, hi there, I need to help. Who, who is some information about Macedonian? Okay, I don't do Macedonian history. Uh, probably best to go look online. Good night, sir. Goodbye. Thanks for the illustration. No problem. Thank you for sharing. No problem. Uh, what's the symbol for Jehuti? Well, Jehuti is just an ibis. And that's... So, everybody, here's, here's Thoth or Jehuti. So, if we're doing the... Wow, well, I don't know why we're not... We're always losing ink. Okay. So Thoth is, we say Jehuti. Jehuti means beaky. That means it refers to the beak of Thoth. So here's basically an ibis, right? There's the beak. You can see the nose of ibis. And then it comes over like that. And then the body curls over like this, you see? And then this comes over like that. I can do it better, but I'm just trying to give it to you faster. Right? And then a little two tail there. So there's the ibis. And the ibis as a hieroglyph can be written two ways. Uh, this is the most common, you'll see it. Juhuti, which is refers to the beak itself, is actually standing on what we call a um, flag or a pole or I forget the name again, I'm losing myself. He's basically stand, oh, on a standard. So he's on a standard. Now, you'd have Jehuti, and then what the, uh, the, the writers would do is they take the name Jehuti, and they complement it with the T and the Y. So they put the T on the bottom like that, and then they put now the, the, the I, the Y is two reeds. I'll show you. It's two reeds like that, okay? I don't know. I'm trying to show it to you in hieroglyphs. So two reeds like this, okay? But it can also be two strokes like that to simplify it. And that's what they did. They added the two lines. So this is Jehuti. You'll find this on many monuments. If you see something like this, you know this is Jehuti or Thoth. All right, next question. What is the symbol of Jehuti? Sir, a typical expert. 
Any tip to become expert in archaeology field of kindly suggest? Well, I don't do archaeology. If you want, I can refer you to somebody who's on my Instagram who does archaeology. I can tell you about her, and you can look at her page. You can ask her questions. Uh, I can only suggest to you getting into the field of Egyptology and learning hieroglyphs and learning history. Have you done ISIS? Yes, I have done ISIS, Lilith. Uh, it's right over here. I've done the nine gods before. I did Osiris, Isis, Nephthys, and Set. All right, next. I've, I've canceled. Okay, I feel sorry for any historians attempting to read any of my curse of millennia for now. Osiris, Iris, Horus, that's are names given by Greeks. No, these are not given. These are the Greek way we pronounce them in Greek, Grixi. Uh, they're not. Uh, the Egyptian gods are long before the Greeks. Uh, they even sort of copied as well from the Egyptian pantheon as well, but had their own uh, gods. I dread to think how they're all created. Uh, there's what, I don't know, known gods of ancient Egypt, so many different. Yeah, there are many different gods, uh, Jen Jen, uh, Jen Ren Jen. Sir, I must need some information. I don't do Macedonian, Sidam, man. Just go look online. I don't do Macedonian. Not sure why you're asking me about Macedonian. No problem, Michael. Sorry, did people Greek worship same gods in Egypt? No, they just they had their own gods, but they had their own stories, but they kind of copied the same pantheonic system of birth and children being born and creation and eating and devouring and things like that. Yes, the beautiful uh, uh, writing, Flo Masco. Nice, thank you. I love Thoth's wisdom. Yes, Thoth is my patron god, so he's basically what I refer myself to. You know, I like thought because I like writing. So he is basically my patron. There are many patrons you can follow. Ta, Osiris, Ra, uh, Horus. I love thought. Hi. It's hard to, to study Egypt. It's so hard to, for me to study Egypt. So many dynasties. What do you recommend? Well, you just message me, guys. If you want any information, tell me what you want. I got tons of books and you can learn that way. Uh, just go slowly. Don't be in a rush to learn. Just Enjoy it. It's a journey. It's a huge undertaking Egyptology. We're learning every day. It's always changing. So, yeah. Can you write Ma'at? Uh, sure. I'll do Ma'at for you. So I'm going through the questions, guys, as best as I can. So Ma'at is also a self-created goddess. Uh, she is created from Ra. She is considered the personification of truth and justice and uh, honesty and so on. So Ma'at can be written in many, many ways, but I'll do the full version of Ma'at. Ma'at is written with this symbol here first. This is the word ma. This is, we'll do it here so you guys know what I'm doing. Ma'at. Okay. Ma'at is written with a sickle. So a scythe to cut the fields, right? You cut the grain and the corn. A scythe. And then you would have um Inside it here, the ma as well, as an additional symbol. This would also be pronounced as ma. It'd be a throne, like a bottom step of a throne. And then you'd have the arm for the ayin, right? And then finally the feminine, t. This is the full version, but her name can come in many versions. Now, you could put the female goddess Ma'at. Uh, most people will do the female version, of course. Uh, most Egyptian scribes use the female version. Um, they will do, of course, the Ma'at. I'm just going to come down like this so you see like that. That's the female coming over like this. Remember, there's no beard for the female. There is a, there's her breast right there because that denotes the feminine. Right? And now, because it's Ma'at, they would include a feather on her head like that. Right? She is Ma'at. Now, the feather, I'll show you what it looks like if you expand this feather. Sometimes it'll just be the feather itself. The feather is an ostrich feather. So a specific feather is not so you know where it's from. The ostrich feather was like this. Right? And it comes like that. And like this. This is an ostrich feather, and then the stem. And then they do is they draw the lines like this across the feather. And this is the feather of Ma'at. It's an ostrich feather. We can even extend this down a little so it looks proper. Yeah, that's it. There. 
So that's the feather of Ma'at. It's just a feather, and that's what they use on the scales of balance to weigh uh, the heart of the judge. So there's Ma'at. Next, any suggestions? Yeah, Lilith, uh, so I just send me a, a DM. I'll send you lots of materials to read for free. You don't have to pay for anything. Everything is free, so no, there's no charge or anything like that. Thank you, thank you, no problem. You're brilliant. It's so nice to see people done interactively. Do you do you these live sessions often? I do them from time to time, Jen Ren Jen, from time to time, uh, just whenever I come on, so you have to kind of check. How is Aten written? Okay, well, Stephen Barrick, Aten is written this way. And we'll finish this off, guys. The Aten of Akhenaten, the heretic king who tried to... Now, the Aten, you can find this in the Old Kingdom. So the Aten is not just a creation of Akhenaten, but it's actually been around for a long time. He just simply chose that god as his own god. So the Aten is much like Ray. It has the sun disk, right? Maybe we can flip this over. Yeah, there we go. So the Aten. Right? All right, the Aten is written as it's pronounced. We don't say Aten in Egyptian. It's pronounced as, right, as Eaton, right, Eaton. And this is the way you write the Aten. The great Aten is written as a reed first for the E sound, right? We're phonetically writing it out, E-T-N. Right? We're doing hieroglyphs now, not hieratic or, or, or cursive. Right? This is a reed from the water, so no, a reed, a water reed. And then you have the T, right, which is the bread loaf. And then you have the water wave for the letter N. And then finally you have to donate Eaton. It's a sun disk, so you do the sun. And there it is. That's the Aten. E10, E10. Okay, muchas gracias, no problem, my pleasure. Do you think Bob Breer's series on hieroglyphs is a good starting point? Oh, absolutely. Also, what's the difference between Middle Egyptian and forms of languages? So, um, uh, A. Alzaro was a great question. So, Bob Breer has 24 lessons. You can find them on YouTube. Uh, I posted some of my story. You guys can follow the links over there. He has 24 lessons. And this is a really, 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 really good lessons to start you off. If you don't want to read a book or anything, definitely go to Bob Breed's 24 Lessons. They're on YouTube. Watch them. They're great. You'll learn a lot. You'll understand the steps. Now, he does make some mistakes here and there. He's, you know, he taught himself hieroglyphs. He learned by reading. Uh, he did, I think, get a degree for it, but he's not as proficient in it as most people that I know, but he's very good. Like, to start you off, he'll make it easy, fun, he'll explain to you the origin of the hieroglyphs and the origin of the culture. Definitely watch those 24, they're fantastic. Uh, okay, Middle Egyptian is considered the standard. So, Middle Egyptian is the highest standard, so like Shakespearean, it's considered the highest. Middle Egyptian is considered the highest standard of writing meaning that the language is very well written grammatically and it's well established when it comes to proper writing. Uh, it's like Shakespeare. You're writing in a very proper, clean, efficient way and that's Middle Egyptian. When you get to the New Kingdom, Late Kingdom, even go to the Old Kingdom, the intermediary periods, the Demotic, you start seeing that the scribes are no longer following the rules. They do write the words. Some stuff is confusing. The, uh, they mix too much tenses together. They don't keep things co coherent they just kind of mix things up and that's the problem but middle egyptian is considered the, the standard and uh that's why egyptologists always refer to that as being the, the proper writing so there it is i just want to say thank you for your kind of amazing oh thank you very much crooked pencil i appreciate it um all right guys so that's it uh, we're done thank you so much for watching i appreciate everybody for being here unless i have two more minutes maybe five more minutes i think i think i think yeah okay yeah I have a couple of minutes, I guess. If you guys have any more questions, definitely DM me if you have requests to learn uh, ancient Egyptian or you want to learn about how to write hieroglyphs, just message me. I got books for you guys and you can learn if you want. So let's just go over this if you're still here because I got a couple more minutes. I can answer some questions. I think what the ink is made of. Okay, so Lilith Soa, the ink is very simple. Egyptians used to use this. It's really just made from charcoal. You grind up charcoal, make sure you get the, the ones that are used for incense, the little uh, pallets. Grind it down to a fine powder and just mix it with water. If you want it to bond so it doesn't kind of like, like it doesn't leave residues, then mix some egg white with it. Just put a little egg white. 
and that's it. It'll create a nice little bonding for you. That's it. You get a nice little consistency. You can use it with a reed, or you can use it with a quill. Sometimes use it with a quill, and it's actually nice with a quill too. All right. Uh, no problem. Uh, no problem. You're welcome. Subalo Novas. What's the biggest mystery out there? I'm not sure. There's a lot of mysteries. That's a pretty broad question. Thank you so much. Super interesting as always. Thank you, Rixie. No problem. Little thanks. Uh, in hieroglyphics, Bennu. Oh, okay, Bennu. Yeah, we can do Bennu. Uh, I like Bennu. It's one of my favorite um, gods. Bennu, like Atum, is self-created. He actually appeared on the Ben Ben as well as Atum. So if you have the great... Oh, yeah, I need more water. Yeah, more water for sure. Uh, if you have the great mountain, right? Right? You have a tomb, right? Right? Whatever, a tomb. But you also had the Bennu, this mythical bird, right? Long legs. And basically is considered much like a phoenix in modern Greeks and Romans, but is not. The Bennu is pretty much an, an aspect of Ra, the sun god. So Bennu is written and uh, pronounced pretty much the same way as you would write. Yeah, so you'd have the foot, right? Ben, that's the B sound. Then you'd have the N for the water wave, and then you'd have the new. Now, sometimes you I'll show you a combination. So you'd have the new, right, like that. And they'll eventually, sometimes they'll add just a curl of rope with it too, like that, for another U sound, to complement the new. So Bennu, right, you're pronouncing it as B, N, and this is U, so the, this complements this and this complements that. So Bennu, waiting from left to right, right to left, Top to bottom, so Bennu, and then you would have to finish it off with the Bennu. Let's see if I can do this nicely without messing it up. The Bennu would have two little kind of feathers, and then you'd have the neck, and then the body, and then you'd have long legs for the Bennu. Very long legs. The Bennu. If you Google Bennu, you'll see the pictures of the Bennu. The Bennu. There it is. All right, that's the Bennu. I don't think so. I'm not sure what that is. Bennu. No, Bennu is not part of the nine. There's only nine. I'll go through it again and we'll be done. Uh, could you do Osiris quick? I'll show you Osiris Alazar. Wow, awesome. Thanks. The ink doesn't smear. Well, the ink is pretty bad. I got to put more water in it. It's a little, it's a little too thick right now. It's just it, water dries out of ch charcoal sucks up water very quickly. So if I put a little water, it'll, it'll write better. See, I lose a lot very quickly. But if I put, you know, should I put a little water? It will look good. All right, we'll add some water right now. <clears throat> so you see, it's a little more watery now. All right, maybe a little too watery, I think, but oh well. But now we get a little better, you see? With a little more water, there's a big difference. It actually sticks better. You can write a little bit because it actually is not so thick, right? So, you know, uh, sure. Um, you know, look at that, much nicer. And it actually lasts a little longer, right? Not that long, but you know, there you go. All right, that's the B, the Sedge B, you know, with the wings. There you go. All right, I'll just show what's her name. Wanted to know the, the hieroglyphs again here. Let's just go through this one more time for her. So, uh, all right, so in the beginning, you had Nun, the chaotic water, and Apep basically is the personification of chaos. And then eventually the, the mountain Ben Ben grew out, and then you had Atum who was self-created. And then he basically masturbated and spat out, when he climaxed, he spat out Shu and Tefnut, which is air and moisture. Air and moisture then created the earth and the sky, Geb and Nut. And then Geb and Nut created their four children, which is Osiris, Isis, Nephthys, and Set. So Osiris, Isis, Nephthys, and Set. 
All right, there we go. Could you do, I really did that, better nine, no, thank you, no problem, I don't think so, not sure, from Toronto, yep, uh, total random, but any idea if Egyptians were allowed to be left-handed over the years, lefties were always to be, I was wondering if, um, well, the right hand was considered better in ancient Egyptian culture, but it didn't despise people for having left-handed, so, yeah, that's it. All right, everybody, I'm going to finish off this video. And I'm going to finish it off by giving you guys a blessing. I do this pretty much every time. So let's go like that. And that's it. No more for questions. We're just going to give you the blessing, guys. So when I when Egyptians would write to, let's say, the pharaoh or something, when they say the name of the pharaoh, they would give a blessing at the t between the title of the pharaoh. They would say, you know, life, prosperity, and health to the pharaoh, and then they would continue on. So I'm basically going to give you guys a blessing. I'm going to wish you guys, you know how we say, have a good day, have a blessed day. Well, in Egyptian, they would say, and I'm going to write a vertical. May you have all, so the word neb, all, right? May you have everything, so all of it, all, neb. And then you write it from top to bottom. May you have all, and I'm going to put the word, the first thing is we're going to write right to left. So may you have all life, right, the un. And then we're going to use the word sa. This is the word for protection. May you have life protection. And then the backbone of Osiris, which is the Jed pillar. May you have stability in your life, you know. So may you have life protection stability. And I'm gonna I'm gonna wish you wealth as well, which is uja. So you know, make some money, be happy, get a good job, you know, buy some things for yourself. Right, prosperity. So life. So I want you first to have a life, and I want you to have protection, and I hope your life, due to COVID and all that stuff, is basically stable. And then after all these three things, I hope you have some money. But finally, the thing that they always added at the bottom, but it was very important to them as much as it was health, life, stability, and health, is the word health, which is sinib, which is written as se na This is the word health. A folded cloth, a water wave, and a foot. So there it is, guys. I wish you all, all life, protection, stability, and basically wealth and opportunity, and finally, health. Take care, all the best, and catch you next time, everyone. Thank you.